All right. Perfect. Hopefully Heidi will join us momentarily as well. She was backstage. I might've just lost her in transit, but we'll wait. Perfect. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to kick things off for our attendees here for the next like minute or so as we wait for some more people to trickle in. But you know, guys, welcome. Welcome to day four of the fifth annual Start at Boston Week. Really appreciate you coming out. Um, I think a few of you probably have been here for the past three sales events happening this afternoon. But as a quick reminder, the chat is a great way over to your right to really make some, you know, new connections. Drop your LinkedIn, tell people who you are, tell people who you're looking to, you know, mingle with or who you're learning to learn from or who you want to talk to after maybe set up some real in-person coffee meetings <gasps> i know i know this it'll be really fun though um another thing too to kind of keep in mind is that over to the far right you will see that q a tab so that q a tab is going to be like your best friend during the session so one of the big things that we do create this week for is to make sure that we can get your questions answered so please feel free to abuse that q a tab and that way heidi knows what you want to learn and she can go and put some of our speakers on the spot it's going to be a good time oh carolyn thank you that was so sweet. I love organizing this. It's like a labor of love. And honestly, all the speakers love being here because they want to volunteer their time and give back to you guys as well. So thank you for attending. All right, guys. Um, oh, I think that's it. I think that was it for my announcements. I've only said this so many times. I can't keep track. All right, Heidi, I'm going to turn this over to you. And I look forward to an amazing panel. Great. Well, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Thanks, Stephanie, for having us here. Um, we, you know, I know that many of you have been in multiple panels today. The focus of today is really to say, okay, you are doing a super job and literally there's steam coming out of your ears and you can't literally be in every meeting, right? Um, trying to sell the next thing. So how do you approach thinking about your first sales hire, right? Like what are the metrics? How do you compensate them? How do you know this is working out, right? So we have Queen, Jay and Anthony here today um, to help us answer those questions. Like Stephanie said, we want this to be interactive. Um, we would love whatever questions I might, I'm gonna pepper in some questions for them and then whatever we see from the Q and A, um, I will add those too. I think we wanna be here to help you with your specific questions. Um, so that's how I'll run it. I'm Heidi Fung. I am the CEO of risedaily.io and we basically are a marketplace where companies can hire senior experts and talent for short projects, two to 20 hours. Um, and previous to this, I was at Monitor Deloitte as an assistant partner. Um, anyway, with that, I'll kick it over to Queen. Um, well, we love having you here. Tell us a little bit more about yourself. I know this is, you've been at Startup Boston multiple times, so we're glad you're, thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Heidi. I'm very excited to be here. I, and um, I'm Queen Alote Papo. I am the CEO and creative director of Queen Adline. Queen Adline is a sustainable fashion brand and it creates wearable art, especially for the woman on the go. Um, our focus is on sustainability in our closets and it is a mission to help eliminate waste in our closets, which in turn would lead to us reducing the waste we create with our textile, which is the number two pollutant of our environment. And our overall vision is to help um, make live a better earth to our children, if not the same, better than we found it. So that's the overarching aim of Queen Adeline. And um, I always tell people that's a high pitch. The low pitch is we need to bring some damn color into the world. So if you're looking for colorful, sustainable pieces, just visit us. <laughs> Love it. Yes, awesome. Anthony, do you want to jump in? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so my name is Anthony Franklin. Um, I'm the vice president of sales at a company called Curate. Oh, I'm losing uh, Anthony. I can't hear. Yeah. So basically what we do is uh, we are a vertical SaaS solution for event professionals. So, you know, the florists, the wedding planners, uh, the caterers out there, um, you know, we're, we're, we're absolutely excited to help them. And, and so we're a seed stage startup. So we're actually um, in the middle kind of later stages of building our first sales team. So I think this, session uh, speaks a lot to what we're doing right now and what I've been helping the team do. So really excited to be a part of this, uh, this great panel. So. That's awesome. Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, I, I love that you guys have literally just 
done this. Um, so it's very close and near and dear to your heart and you can tell us your experience with it. Jay, welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. I'm Jay Green, the co-founder and VP sales at Introduced. We're a Boston-based hiring platform that helps tech startups hire sales, tech, and marketing. And I was the first salesperson at Introduced. So uh, like Anthony, uh, this is something that I, I'm currently doing. And I was also the first salesperson at Wayfair back in 2010. So this is the second time I've done it. And I'm excited to, to chat with you all and, and share some ideas. Great. Thanks so much. Well, maybe we'll just kick it off first with... Um, with Jay, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, you've been the first salesperson, you've hired the first salespeople, you know, how do you know when your business is ready, right? And how do you know what level of salesperson, right? Is it an AE? Is it someone who's been a VP of sales and really wants to like roll up their hands and roll up their sleeves and get involved? Like, how do you know when you're ready and who yeah. are you ready for? It's interesting because I, we've helped a couple of companies recently hire their first salespeople. So I've seen it myself and also from the companies that we support. And at Introduced, uh, our CEO, Jonathan, brought me on after he had done the proof of concept and he was ready to scale. So what, what we always recommend to our partners is it's time to bring that salesperson on when, you've, when you have some proof of concept, you, you've sold to some customers, you, you kind of understand a bit about who your ideal customer is and it's time to, to put a full-time resource towards it. And, and typically we recommend, and I recommend, it's not a, a vice president of sales, it's more of a doer, someone who can wear many hats and, um, and, and move really fast without being bogged down by uh, you know title or anything like that. Um. Queen Anthony, feel free to jump in with your experience. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'd love um, to jump Heidi, in. Heidi, I'm sorry, I just did it. I, I didn't get any of the feed coming from Jay or Anthony, so if you can just sort that, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Oh, yeah, yeah, sh yeah, sure. Um, uh, you were just talking about when did you hire your first salesperson um, and what level were they? Like, when did you do it and what level were you at? And then we'll let Anthony answer after that. Um, sure. Um, for me, um, I think my my product is kind of different because it is a, it's a consumable, and so um, right from the start, um, I had to go through the concept of launching and then um, proving my concept, making sure that I had my um, sales going as a founder myself, and until I had proven the product. And I was ready to bring somebody else in to grow. And so when did I know I needed somebody else to take this? Obviously, when um, the product was doing well and I needed extra hands on board to meet the demand that was out there. And obviously, I didn't want to have um, burnout out as well. So that was exactly the time that I knew, all right, it's time to bring other people on board. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, so sorry, um, we interrupted you. no worries, no worries. Um, it's all technical snafus, right? Um, so I think there's probably three or four things in my mind you need to have in place before you bring on a, a salesperson, right? I think and it's going to sound silly, but it's easy to get lost in startup plan where you're just kind of like creating things. So, so I think first is, do we know what problem we're actually solving, right? Because you may have been playing around with a, a product, but is it actually solving a problem? And do we know exactly what that problem is? Uh, does it actually work, right? So if I have a product, is it actually, you know, the, the value I'm telling other people that they're getting is, are people actually getting that value from this, right? Because that's really critical for a salesperson who's going to be selling. They're just going to churn out the back if you don't communicate the value and then deliver that value. Um, I think another one is, is someone going to actually pay us? So this is before you get a salesperson in, right? So the founder themselves, I'm, I'm a big believer in founder-led sales, right? That the, if the founder can't sell this, no one's likely going to be able to sell this, okay? You put your passion into it. You know the market. Uh, like, you've got to be able to prove that you can sell this to people. 
And not just one or two people, you need to sell this to a lot of people, right? Now, when I say a lot, I mean, I'm talking 20 or 30 sales, something like that. Uh, but essentially, you, and it can't just be other portfolio companies from your investor. And those are not real sales, right? Sales of people that you don't know, right? That paid you money. Okay, now we're ready to bring someone in um, because now we've proven that this is a product that, that we could sell. So. Um, so I would put all those things before actually bringing in um, a salesperson. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think what is, I remember um, early, at early stages of my company, so I was like, I think I need a salesperson because I've hit some sort of plateau, right? And um, my advisor was like, actually, like you can't hire anyone until you're like going gangbusters and you literally can't service the sales. If you're hitting a plateau, that's because you've gone beyond family and friends and there's something, you don't quite have product market fit, right? Um, how, how do you, you know, um, Anthony, I said, you, you said you need like more than 20 to 30 sales of people who aren't your friends and family or someone in your investor portfolio. How, you know, I, I mean, every business is different, but like, what are those benchmarks usually? Because salespeople are expensive, right? And they're used to jobs where they get compensated. So, you know, how do you, I guess that gets to the second question. How do you get salespeople to take the leap to join your company, right? Like what, what are they going to want to see before they join your company? So. Sure. I mean, I think it's really strong if you've got real sales from, um, you know, non-friends and family and in, 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 in other portfolio companies. I think that's part of it. I think part of it is also like there's such a confidence you get as a salesperson in um, having someone that's done this before and you have confidence that what they're telling you is real. Right. And I think uh, a lot of this is about confidence and a lot of this is about data that you can actually share with the salesperson right um that they can actually start to iterate on and they can start to iterate on the sales process because essentially what you're doing is you're taking the sales process from you as a founder that you've implemented and with all the mistakes and you may feel like you're not that great at sales or a salesperson could come in and really do this but the truth is you're actually a phenomenal salesperson Right. And you want to be able to share those tips and tricks with a salesperson that can go out and implement some of those strategies and improve upon those. Right. So when I'm you know, when I'm now, uh, I, I do think there is that plateau you discussed where sometimes it looks like there's a lot of sales on the board, but we have to be realistic. And again, these benchmarks are flexible. Some people do it at 10 sales, five sales if you're targeting in enterprise companies. Right. Um, versus, you know, maybe some, someone, you know, a smaller high velocity sale, but, you know, typically that's how I look at it, right. Is you want to be able to pass something off that's imperfect to your salespeople. And you can't do that unless you have actually developed a very simple playbook. That makes sense. Um, Jay, do you have any thoughts on that front? I like the idea of like having, thank you, Anthony, of like, you need to have a playbook in place. You need something for them to work with. You can't just be like, here's my product. Now go and sell it. Right. It's like, here's, you know, you, you're sharing with your salesperson, like as a founder, here's how I got these sales, right? These are the target customers and here's the playbook that we use with them. Um, I think, I think that's really helpful. Jay, is there anything you would add to that as well? Like, how do you attract this um, salesperson to come and work for your startup. Yeah. I mean, I think Anthony laid out a great playbook on, on how to attract great people. Uh, it's funny because when I joined introduced, we, we basically had no customers and I was enticed by equity. So, so the other piece is if you don't have the playbook, but you're offer up enough equity for the right person, you know, that's attractive for me. I was looking at more end game than, you know, potential current situation. So, um, but there's less salespeople willing to take the risk that I took at the stage that we were at introduced than what Anthony is talking about. So uh, I agree, um, you know, you want the playbook, you, you want some customers that are actual paying that you could then show the salesperson in the interview process, hey, talk to this customer uh, and learn from them the value of your product, because that gives you as a salesperson confidence because you're talking to a customer, you see the value and you're starting to your the brain, your brain is moving to say, wow, you know, like this is something I can go out there and sell. 
because of X, Y, Z. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, um, especially yeah, the piece. Of I, I, can I just add one more thing, and I, I love you know. It's, it's great. Jay's here. He's like the first guy at Wayfair. That's crazy, you know, uh, but it's like the, the maverick right there. We're, we're, we're it, it was a crazy that. time in 2010. Uh, that's so cool. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I think, you know, equity is a great point there. And, and I think you said and I think the other thing that you need is you need real ROI numbers. Right. So it's it's the value exchange is I'm giving money away. If I'm a customer, I'm giving money in exchange for some kind of business value that my company, if this is B2B or B2C, if it's a person, I'm getting this kind of value and the salesperson needs to be able to prove that value. And he's not going to, he or she is not going to be able to do that, right? They're going to need the founder's help in understanding not just the product, but the ROI that these early customers have gotten. So I've actually been, I've worked with some founders where, they have the 20 or 30, but they've not really kept very good track of the ROI of those first 20 or 30. So the salesperson really doesn't have a ground to stand on to go out and ask for large sums of money. Because again, you there's an exchange happening here. And so I think that's another element I put in there um, that, that you want to have before you bring on that first salesperson for sure. So uh, just want to add that point. I think that's a really, really salient point because sometimes in startup world, we're like, okay, we just need to sell contracts, right? Or we just need users. And once you have them on, you're like, okay, never mind. But beginning to think like those first 20 or 30, but, you know, over, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, a few weeks, a month, six months, you stay close to them and you understand what the ROI is so that you're really bringing a value proposition to the market that's your product and all the other benefits. And also they're the first people to have bought the product. So they fundamentally believe it too. So they can be those champions. And I think either it was you or Jay said, like you will want as you onboard that first salesperson to connect them to these early customers so they can hear from their own, you know, from the customer's mouth, like, what is the value and how to sell it? Because you may have missed something as a founder, right? There might be a nugget that will help them sell the next hundred that comes out of the mouth of your customer. I love that. Um, Jay, I think there was a question from Tim Stansky. Um, how, how did you approach your start and introduce a brand with less recognition than your high flying momentum um, at Wayfair? Yeah, I, I had a couple of journeys in between the two, um, but... <laughs> It, it's funny because I, I, I was a, a young dad. I had two kids and I, I was ready to take control of my destiny and, and introduce, let me do that, right? Be, be in control as opposed to, to being um, in a long chain of command, which, which is what I got at other funded companies. So um, my thought process was, was I'm a builder and, and I, I love the idea of figuring it out and um, it's funny because at my last company, I, I was an early beta customer of introduced, uh, I, I was free. So, so Jonathan, our CEO, and I had a deal where he gave me access to the introduced hiring platform and I gave him free advice. So we had that relationship for a year. I built up trust. I was a user of the platform and I believed in it because I hired three salespeople off of it. And then when the time was right, I, I joined. So, um, like Anthony was saying, you know, you, I was the customer <laughs> and, and I loved it so much that, that, that I, that I joined as the first salesperson. So I had the trust. Uh, otherwise I don't think I would have made the leap into something that was at the time, you know, we, we hadn't even sold a hundred thousand dollars in revenue. So it was very, very early. And to this day, we still haven't, we, we've, we've raised no money. So it's uh, self-funded is a different journey than a lot of companies in Boston. True that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think you also hit on like another way to attract your early and amazing salespeople, which is, you know, this this opportunity to know that they're not like someone six levels down or, you know, three levels down in the totem pole, but this chance to actually be the person who helps the founder make or break whether this comes to life, especially in um, companies which are not, are like kind of bootstrapping it still, right? Like yeah. you are inherently so trusted to make this a reality because if you can't help them sell that this company and product will go down right so it's and to 
have that chance to make a difference um, is really compelling for a lot of people um, who are looking for to do something different. I love yeah, that. Yeah, and, and that's what I was looking for. I've always worked at bigger companies where I'm putting in a, a, a little box. Your responsibility is this. And I wanted more. And, and, and that's what being the first salesperson at both Wayfair and Introduce provided me. And, and it's, as Anthony probably would, would knows at this point, it's, there's no ride like being the first and, and blazing the trails. Um, so on that, on that, on that note, what is it like for a first salesperson? Like if there's folks on here who are salespeople, I know there, there's people who are founders, there's first people who want to join um, startups as a first salesperson. What's that ride like as a first salesperson? I mean, especially if you were corporate before, you're really used to like super clear compensation. Like, you know, there's a clear playbook that's given to you and you just go out and work your magic. And then the formula, like, you know, you do X and then it'll produce Y. What's it like at a startup? that first year, what can you expect results wise? Um, Do you want me to answer or? Anyone will jump in. Okay, <laughs> I, I'm happy to answer. I mean, it, it, I'd call it organized chaos. It's, um, you know, to this day, I'm still our only salesperson closing new clients. So I, I you know, I have that piece. I, I'm also helping on account management and just growing our, our, our organization. So. I have to be very organized and great mm. at managing my priorities. And, and I am constantly reprioritizing every single day because I have to know what's the highest ROI activity. Is it, is it talking to this new potential client? Is it working with a current client? Is it, is it something else that just popped up? So you have to be really good at being flexible, um, you know, reprioritizing organization, uh, I'm constantly blocking my time. I'm, I'm shutting down Slack. I'm saying I'm prospecting or I'm, you know, I'm working with this one client. So you have to be super disciplined or, or it, it will likely not end well. Yeah. And just to, to add on there, I think the, the, the life of the first salesperson, um, as Jay mentioned, is hectic, but it's also different for every organization because it really depends on how much work the founders have done to prepare that person, that first salesperson to come in. Right. Um, so I think for all the founders out there, you know, I, I, I hope you're, you're hearing that, Hey, there's a lot of work to be done to prepare sort of a non founder to go out and sell because there's a level of abstraction that's happening um, from the founder. They don't have your experience. They don't have your connections. They don't have perhaps even your industry experience. So you're really going to need to, uh, write down and document a lot of these things. Right. But uh, I, I think, you know, typically I think a lot of the things we think of with sales, but the truth is, um, again, they're usually going to need to, you know, have a list of people they're targeting. Right. I think uh, they're going to need to do everything from, you know, lead generation um, to selling, to proving the value, to closing, and then depending on the, the way the organization works, they may need to do customer success as well. So um, so I think they could be involved in writing the messaging. They could be involved in email outreach, you know, uh, developing a presentation, uh, the demo, right? If it's perhaps a, a software product, um, you know, anyway, I just think there's a lot of things. So the reason why it's the first salesperson is hard is because there's not an exact playbook. And that's what's challenging is this person has to be very versatile. They have to be willing to adapt. And perhaps in two months, the role and how they spend their time is gonna be completely different than how they spent the first two months, right? Um, and, and, and that's why I, I think they're gonna have a heck of a lot of experience and be someone that's gonna stay with you for a long time, hopefully in this journey, so. And I think the other thing is they're a friend. That's the truth, right? Like just start up, you know, starting anything is tough. It's lonely. And uh, that first salesperson you bring in is a friend, right? It's someone that you you would buy from. It's someone that hopefully provides some, you know, uh, a companion on the journey, right? And uh, when you're an entrepreneur versus everybody, right? And I think that's key. And, and so you want to hire someone that you would definitely 
enjoy spending time with and teaching and, and all of that. So anyway, it's probably onto a different topic of who to find, but I think that's what the typical day looks like. And, and, and something to also add is uh, I, I learned, especially at introduce, like figuring out your, your ideal customer profile early is really, really important. When I, when I got to introduce, I was targeting companies that were way out, like the, 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 I had no business targeting them and I wasted a lot of time and they didn't see value in my product because they were the wrong people. So I worked to find my ICP quickly and and that helped me win more deals and have more happy clients and me have more success because I was spending my time in the right areas. And like Anthony saying, if the founder has figured that out already, it makes the salesperson's life that much easier. I had to figure that out myself and um, it just made my ramp a little slower but the faster you get there, the faster you can have success. That, that's really good. That's super good advice. So let's just say you're like, okay, I have my target ICP. I have some early traction. Um, I paid customers and I'm, I'm really ready to get this partner on this journey with me. I think they can, you know, with their sales talent, really help me to like amplify sales so I can focus on other things too you know, and you're like, okay, let's start casting a net, like maybe even before starting to cast a net for folks, you know, how much should an initial salesperson be paid? I know, I don't know if you guys feel comfortable sharing this kind of, and I know it depends. I know it depends. Right. But like ballpark, like for a startup that's, you know, bootstrapping, that's pre not pre money, but you know, they're clearly not anyway, maybe they're like under a hundred K like, how do you even think about compensation? Yeah, that's it's 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 tough because some companies will will hire like the founder will keep like for myself. I think our next salesperson will be someone to help me prospect, right? I'll still be the closer, but I'll have a, a someone prospect. So so that would be a traditional BDR type person. Other companies want to hire um, a doer, right? Like a salesperson, a closer, and you know, in Boston, you're easily talking $200,000 all in, right? Something easily a hundred, hundred um, for, for something that's a relatively decent sized opportunity, right? We're not talking like tiny deals, but it needs to be worth it for them to make the leap and take the quote unquote risk. And, um, you know, we, we just helped a company hire a first, the first full-time salesperson a few months ago. And, and the equity was a, a big piece of it, but also the compensation plan was very lucrative, right? There were a lot of opportunities for this person to earn a lot of money. And, and what I always recommend is for the first time sales per person, a lot of assumptions are made of what that person can close, how much revenue they can drive. But quickly, when you have a full-time person selling, a lot of those assumptions will get thrown out the window. So founders need to understand that um, you put a compensation plan in place on day one, they likely should check in with the salesperson and have some sort of 90 day, hey, how are we doing? Do you feel confident that the, the plan we set out and we agreed on is realistic? Because if it's not and the salesperson loses the motivation, they're not gonna stick around long. So you have to make it worth it. And sometimes it makes sense to compensate in other ways than just revenue for that first person, may pay them a, a higher percentage on pipeline or getting customers into, into trials or something that gets the momentum and builds the, the repetition and the learnings, um, but not just on revenue like you might on a more established company. Yeah, I think the difficulty here too, and, and that was great what Jay said there, the difficulty here is there's no real metrics to pursue here. And often, um, in my experience, founders uh, will have metrics in mind, but the, and, and there you may even have a, a template you worked off of that, you know, you kind of got from somewhere. But the, the truth is, like, you really just need very simple compensation, like the most simple you can get it, like yeah. five sales in the next three months, right? Like that's something we can work with, right? And then how much are you willing to pay for that? You're gonna pay a lot on those five sales, 
But the truth is you're just looking for something that's repeatable and predictable, right? Because the truth is, you know, um, you're often looking to do the same thing the next month and the next month, but to amp that up and, and grow as a company, right? So um, I, I think it's much better to do near-term compensation plans. It's it's difficult to say. I, I mean, I've uh, hired and um, also seen people hired that were significantly under, you know, I would say what the, the actual average comp was in that city um, because they really did believe in the plan, right? But you're not going to be able to get away for that for long, right? So that's like to get someone in the door and then you're going to have to pay them close to market rate, especially if they're winning deals, right? So at the end of the day, you're not going to get away for very long, not paying, you know, average compensation. Um, and, you know, typically I think um, you also are not going to pay a, a heavy commission. There's different people that think differently about this, but you're also not going to pay a heavy commission split uh, at the beginning, right? Because mm -hmm. it there's nothing to go off of. So if somebody, and again, some of this is personal experience when I work for startups and then also founders I work with, right? If I'm coming into the company and you tell me that we've got 30 sales in the last, I don't know, year, two years, whatever, some of those were friends and family, but we want you to come on and, and kind of help us build this, right? Mm. The numbers, we don't have any numbers to go off of, right? So if you say I have 100K base and 100K commission on top of that, that actually means nothing, right? Because we don't know if non-founders can go out and actually sell this at the rate you've been selling it, right? Mm -hmm. So you it's a significant risk to them, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually usually better to have um, and again, this depends on where you're at, but it's usually better to compensate people on the higher side if you can. Now, if you're bootstrapped, you know, probably gonna have to forget all this, right? Um, but if you're if you've got any kind of investment, a lot of that's gonna go towards copying salespeople at the beginning, um, you know, while you kind of get the machine going, right? Mm -hmm. There's no way of getting around it. So cool. <laughs> That's super helpful. I see Queen is back. So Queen, can you tell us a little bit about how you've thought about compensation for um, your earliest salespeople and how you attracted them to come join you? Oh, I can't hear you, Heidi. <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, you can't hear me. Can you hear me? No. Okay. Um, okay. I will type it into the notes, um, but um, I will type my question into the notes. You can read it and then jump in when they stop. But maybe let's cut to the Q&A. Um, Kenzie asked, would you say it's an absolute that the salesperson has the same mindset and attitude as the company culture you're trying to create? No. Mm -mm. It doesn't need to be. That would that that would be my my two cents on this, right? Again, you're there'll be a time and place for you to hire only people that are according to your own culture, right? Um, and mindset of your organization. But right at, at the beginning, you're just looking to find people that you would buy from, right? And that you feel confident that could sell this to your customers, right? So um, there'll be plenty of time to, I think, continue building an organization that, that, you know, matches your culture and mindset and the, and what you're trying to build in the company. That'd be my two cents. Mm -hmm. I, it's interesting. I mean, I, I think of it, I think of it as different. I mean, we're, uh, we're, we're a 12 person company. And um, to this point, we've been very careful to hire uh, all different types of people, but ones that, that fit into the, the value system that we've created. Um, yeah. So I would rather not hire someone that I think could, could sell a million dollars if I think that, that they're going to bring the wrong attitude to the organization. I'd rather hire someone that, that would sell less but be a better team player or wear more hats or other things. So, I mean, um, it, it interesting it interesting that Anthony and I are, are, are split on this, but but I, I feel... Um, I feel that that's actually one of the most important things I look for. And yeah, I think founders, I, I will, you have to be comfortable. Go ahead, Queen. 
Jay, I would I would um, jump on that. Um, I would agree with you. For for me, especially, like I said, um, my my product uh, consumables, and so um, to be able to prove that that salesperson can replicate what the founder has done, they need to be on board with the culture that we are trying. We've set and we are trying to move forward with. And so definitely um, that is going to be one of the traits I will look out for. Um, we need to share some values and, and be part of the culture we are trying to create because that's going to be an extension of, of the brand when they're out there and, and they are facing um, the consumer. And so, um, yeah, maybe Anthony, you're on your own here, <laughs> but I'm definitely also leaning towards um, getting somebody that would fit into the culture that we are creating. Yeah, and, and just a, um, one last point on this uh, here, and I think everyone's entitled to kind of the, their thoughts of what, what they're going to build, so that's great. But uh, I do think, you know, I think the idea here is, is it absolute, right? Mm. So, mm. you know, for me, that's what I'm more of trying to say is it's not an absolute open and shut case, right? So yeah. if I've got two reps that I can bring on that are a different mindset and attitude of me, right? Maybe cultural values, some of those are the same, right? But maybe I'm a founder that's not super outgoing, right? Maybe I'm a founder mm -hmm. that is looking to build something that's, you know, incredible and amazing, but my, I myself am maybe not that way, right? And, and charismatic, if I should say. You know, I think you can re recruit people that maybe are not like yourself and maybe even not like the organization you're trying to build. The point here is, you know, in the short, short term, you are going to build that, right? Because mm -hmm. the idea here is like, you know, this one person's not going to be the organization, right? I'm going to hire right. two after that and then two more after that. And you're going to build a full sales team, right? And you're going to have to have a lot of variety on that sales team because that variety is going to help you go to market. You don't want just one cookie cutter kind of person that yeah. fits this sort of scenario. So it's more of the absolute. Maybe if he didn't put that word there <laughs> okay. um, or she, you know, um, you know, maybe I would have said it a little bit differently, but I, I don't think it's an absolute up, open and shut case for me. Right. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, thank you, Anthony. That's what I was thinking too. And I, I think this links back to your earlier point around like, if you have your playbook, you're super clear on your target ICP, you know what the value proposition is, you know what you're selling. You know, if a salesperson is interested in your product, feels passionate about you, shares some basic culture, they will be able to sell it, right? Because they know who they're selling. To Jay's point, he had to figure that out, right? At first, like he wasn't selling to the like right group, right? But if if the founder has already figured that out with early traction, then this is about going after this in an amplified way with a variety of skills. Um, that makes a ton of sense to me. Queen, do you want to jump in with your kind of story about how you think about salespeople, how you've approached compensation, et cetera? Okay, we are. I, I feel like Queen can't hear me, but that that's cool. Let's let's see. Oh, there might be something else in the Q and A. Okay, if you had two great candidates, both looking for similar comp, what would be the deciding factor in hiring your first salesperson? Mm. It's great a, question. It's a, it's a great question. Yeah. So a, a couple of things here I would put in: uh, Have they sold to my size of customer before? Right. So small business, enterprise, mid-market, have they sold to this, a similar size company, right? Um, how much experience they have in that to a certain degree. You don't, you know, again, startup land's not about, let me get as many, you know, ex years of experience into the organization. Typically you're trying to differentiate yourself from some of the big players out there. So that's not always necessary, years of experience, but there should be some experience selling to your customers, right? I think that's number one. I think number two, and, and I keep saying this, but this needs to be a person that you think our customers would want to buy from, and you should be convinced about that. Um, I think that would make the deciding factor between two equally great people. Of course, there's a bunch of other factors. Jay's probably better at talking about, uh, you know, what to look for in hiring than, than even myself, but um, certainly I think, um, you know, those two things are, are things that would distinguish one candidate over the other for me. 
I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think size, size of deal and industry is, is, is a nice to have uh, that, that, that's certainly helpful. Uh, I, I also look at communication style. Um, you know, are they strong communicators? Are, are they good writers? Do they know how to be concise and create compelling messages? Are they storytellers? I, I think that's really important. And then also what, what's their attitude? Are, are they coming into the startup uh, ready to grind? Cause that's what it will be. Or, um, you know, are, are, are they looking for something else? So make sure that their motivations align with, with what the responsibility of the role, which, which, you know, it, it's not easy being at any startup, let alone responsive for all of the revenue or most of the revenue. And, and that made me think, have they been part of a startup too? That would also distinguish them, right, for me. So, um, yeah. the, you know, the kind of helter skelter that startup land is sometimes, you actually need to be used to an acceptable level of chaos. Um, and uh, typically people that have not, that they're going to they're gonna have a hard time, so. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I think my follow-on question from there is also like, you know, in in salesperson world, corporate sales, you know, you hire someone for a salary, the trajectory is really clear, the inputs are clear, the outputs are clear, right? For, you know, how have you seen, you know, even though it's an annual salary, have you seen situations where we're like, you know, let's just try this out for three months, right? Like, how far can you get in like 60 days? How far you can get in 90 days? And then we have a check-in. Is that like a model for hiring your first salespeople or does it take longer for them to really find their footing with your product and your customers? Um, Cause I could see how someone's like, okay, this makes sense, but I don't know how much of a risk to take. Right. They might have some financial responsibilities, et cetera, but they could actually be the perfect salesperson for you. The, I mean, there, there are companies that, that will bring in like uh, an advisor who, who could do some, uh, some of that work as a part-time basis, I, I think it would be difficult to get traction unless you're you're in it and you know full time. I think what a lot of companies do is they will guarantee commission for a period of time, three months, six months. It depends on the length of the deal. So that way, the salesperson comes in, they know that they're going to make X amount of dollars, which helps them uh, mentally launch into this, knowing that they're not going to start closing deals day one like mm -hmm. they might if they went to an established company. So I, I'm a big believer in in guaranteeing compensation for a period of time or having a different commission plan for the first 30, 60, 90, 120 days based on metrics like having conversations with customers, um, you know, get, get, getting them to commit to take a trial or opening opportunities or something that's not revenue generating so they can feel that they're gaining momentum. That makes sense that those are super actionable steps i i really like that the guaranteed commission and then also like you know the metrics being you know the how to get people in the funnel right even if it isn't conversion um great um okay so we have more questions i'm just gonna instead of keep going going i'm just gonna go for the questions um where we are in reese ryan says we are in a niche vertical industry how important it is is it for the salesperson to come from that industry in some fashion Oh, this is a fun one. I like this one. Uh, there's been a lot of people that are going to uh, argue me on, with me on this. And there, let me put a caveat here. There are some industries of which you need to find someone from that industry, right? So like, I don't want someone in cybersecurity that's not been in cybersecurity. Like that's, that, that's too technical of an industry that you don't want to just train people from, right? But for the vast majority of SaaS industries, right, um, you know. Do we, we lose Anthony? Oh, we might have lost Anthony. Uh, so I, I'll, I'll jump in. It looks like entertainment, film, TV, sports is, is the um, is the industry. I mean, I'll tell you, I'm in the recruiting industry today and I've never been in the recruiting industry in the past. So I don't think industry you must have industry experience i think like anthony was saying a technical uh sale like cybersecurity, it's it, it might be a must but recruiting or maybe film tv 
uh, it's more attitude and and the fact that the person's a quick learner. Uh, I don't think Rolodexes have a huge value, although in my, in my world, selling to Boston SaaS ecosystem, it is actually helpful. But um, so, so to answer the question, I, it's not a must and it wasn't for me. I've never sold recruiting. Um, when I was the first person at, at Wayfair, I, I had never sold furniture. So, um, I, I just, I, I figured it out and, and that's the type of person I think you're looking for someone who will just come in, put their head down, learn a ton, um, make mistakes, get 1% better every single day and, and have a lot of fun while they're doing it with the right attitude. Can I jump in here real quick? Um, to add to that, I think um, one of the things that would give um, make your salesperson successful would be the kind of training program you have. So to Jay's point, even if they don't have the industry experience, if you have um, a very good solid program to get them um, hitting the ground running and they are quick to learn and are on board with the uh with the mission of the organization they should be fine yeah i love that which is like you know how do you what are the materials that you have to help people get prepared and help them be more successful on day one i love that thanks queen um okay i'm going to another question so kenzie says check references check references check references is that correct what are some red flags to look for potentially controversial answer here, but I, I do not believe in reference checks. Um, I, I think reference checks are great if you have red flags or yellow flags. So if you feel like someone isn't going to be able to grind, or if you feel like the person, um, you know, might be embellishing on their accomplishments, you know, getting reference checks that answer those specific yellow, potential yellow flags is important, but, a lot of companies slow down the process by checking references where, you know, almost always they're, they're glowing. Right. So I, I never check references. I, I, I personally don't believe in them, but that's me. Queen, what, 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 what do you, what do you think about references? I think it, it's dependent on the industry really, because if you are going to be in a position, you're in an industry where, um, like you said, you, you have some doubts and there's some red flags, I would just say do your due diligence and 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 go forward and um, do reference checks. But if it's not a sensitive industry and you can hit the ground running, I mean, what are the things that would make you um, that would give you red flags apart from them embellishing? Probably it would be a bad high. But then if you have like financial risk um, involved and um, it's gonna be a costlier um, um, mistake to not have checked your references, then I would say go ahead. But I think it's it's kind of dependent on the industry. You can wing it and just go along. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think what I've always done is uh, if I have potential concerns, I, I, I will have additional conversations with that person and I, I'm gonna be transparent and say, hey, here's something I'm thinking about. Can you talk more about X, Y, Z? uh over the over the phone or ideally over video to to get their their verbal cues or nonverbal body cues right to, to, just to, to check in on my assumptions so um that's what i've done and and i'll, I'll I may maybe add a few steps and and that tends to get me to figure out if my gut feeling is right or wrong so um i'm also going to add to that jay is speaking from a point of view of he's had some experience with recruiting okay and so we <laughs> yes. are talking about a founder who who's never probably hired anybody else to do anything and i would say to you if you have um those um doubts or um you just are not too clear with that two things you can seek a second opinion from somebody else who knows what you're doing recruiting or um, to Jay's point, just go ahead and see if you can clarify whatever your doubts are around that. But there's never any, I always tell people like two heads are better than one. And as a founder, if you're hiring, that is not your job and that is not your best. You look for Jay, look for those who are good at that and, and give them the job. <laughs> well, <laughs> and, and, and Queen, you, you give a great point. I mean, this is literally the life I live. 
But yeah. um, what we do in our interview process is we, we bring a lot of folks at our company in, including who would be their peers. And mm-hmm. in those peer interviews, they're uh, casual, right? They're, they're, there's no agenda that the, the potential employee can ask whatever questions they want. So, you know, th- th- that's a great way that we found to get into motivations and also help both sides buy in because, you know, we as a company have to sell the opportunity as much as the candidate has to sell themselves. And I think a lot of companies think of it as they need to sell me, but the market is incredibly um, tight right now in terms of finding great people. So we have to sell as a company as much as the candidate has to sell themselves, right? It's a two-way street. Yeah, absolutely. Anthony, we're just having a conversation about you know, do you need references? Like what's your, you know, what is your perspective on references? What do you do if you have concerns? Um, Do you have a perspective on that? Like before you hire? Yeah, I I mean, I'd like references. I mean, um, I ask for them. Um, At that stage though, I'm typically, uh, I've already made a decision on the candidate and I'm just checking to make sure I can set them up for success. I mean, it, again, if something comes up, I, I will put the, you know, the, the, the hold on kind of hiring for the role. But essentially at that point, I'm already, I'm, I'm looking to set them up for success and seeing how they performed at previous roles um, to, to try to create an environment they're successful. So um, I think re- referrals are a little old fashioned. I mean, truth is I can just reach out um, for any of the referrals I need to um, just with quick few calls um to former employers so um just my two cents um my opinion on it yeah um okay so i have another question which is okay so they check out the gut check or what we used to call in consulting the airplane test like would you want to spend like nine hours stuck on a plane with this person um and they check out and you're like this is good they have a really good track record they've you know, work for a startup, or if they haven't, they're like really scrappy and they have like a compelling reason like Jay had for like, you know, getting off the corporate track and like really learning the startup ways. So you're a few months in and you're really not seeing the results, right? Let's just say they might be doing the right things, but for some reason sales aren't converting or you're as a founder being pulled into all these sales, you feel like you're still closing. What do you do then, right? Like, or, you know, what are different KPIs and metrics you can put in place to ensure that you have, you know, you can keep track of what's happening? Because in startup land, we know that time is very compressed, right? Like, can't wait for a whole year with someone who's not producing results. And do you want the answer from from a, a founder or salesperson's perspective or both? Both, both. <laughs> From a founder's perspective, and I think Anthony talked about this a lot, like you should have some deals under your belt, uh, not to just your friends. So, so you know how long deals have taken to close. And, and if you set proper expectations up front on, on what you expect in the first 90 days, I mean, uh, I think the founders should make themselves available often to meet with this salesperson at least weekly for an hour to to really check in there there shouldn't be any surprises that you know 90 days pop up and nothing's closed and, and you were hoping they would as a founder so so having upfront expectations on what good looks like in terms of metrics but also to look at the qualitative and quantitative data in your CRM which what i care about personally is is calls emails and number of conversations so a, as the only salesperson i track conversations which are people that I've had either some sort of email or phone exchange with that had some sort of future potential, even if it's not today. So that way, if my boss could check and say, Hey, Jay's having a number of connect of conversations, he's doing the right activities. So um, if I wasn't having conversations and the sales weren't coming in and I wasn't making calls, I wasn't making emails, then it's a different perspective. So, so that's the founders, I guess, take, Um, I don't know if queen or Anthony have, you know, take from like a salesperson's perspective. Um, right. I was just going to go off the founders and then I'll, I'll address the salesperson. So um, you touched on, on really salient points as to um, are they, 
are they going through the steps in the funnel to making that sale? And I definitely want to see like where the bottleneck is, where are they stuck? Um, what is not, con why is it not converting? And if they are doing everything that, like you said, there's a trail to that the process, then um, <laughs> I always go back to like, what is your data telling you uh, in that cycle? Um, is this normal? Um, if it is normal, then probably are we looking at the product as well and what is happening with the product? So that there's a whole lot of um, moving parts with this kind of question. Um, and data is always your best friend. I always tell people when it comes to sales. Um, so in a scenario like this, definitely if you've gone through the funnel and it looks like they are doing everything right um, and it's just not converting, then you just want to see what your data is telling you about that cycle or that um, period. And then you can make some informed decisions as to whether they are performing or not. And then from the sales um, point of view, from the salesperson's point of view, um, I would, if, if I were in that position, I would like to understand more where the, um, the, the um, what's the word, um, where the, the, the bottleneck is in the process and mm -hmm. where the, the, where I'm losing the sale is at. And so probably I'm not selling the product the right way I should be selling it, or I probably I probably need to approach this in a different way. So, and and, and I always come back to for me it's more different um, because it's a product, and so I get firsthand experience, so I get feedback as to why it is not selling versus if it's if it's a, um, a tech product or. And there are other decision makers involved. And so I think just looking at the data would tell you where you are not connecting and where the sale is not, why you are not um, arriving at the sale. So those are two different uh, approaches to, is this person the right person or is it on our side? Yeah. I realize we, we only have a minute left. Thank you, Queen. Um, I see Stephanie's back. Um, I With the minute left, I just wanted to thank Jay, Queen, and Anthony. I think I go back to something that all three of them kind of talked about, which is how do you attract that salesperson in this very tight labor market, right? To come and join your startup, to join your, um, join you. And what's in your favor is that you know the product, you have the story, you have the passion, and they can feel that. And if you can explain to them that they're going to be right next to you as you build this business, and this is the chance for them to kind of get out of the grind and really make a difference and make a huge impact, that is what will bring people to you. So um, thank you, everyone, for joining us for this panel. Thank you, Jay, Queen, Anthony, Stephanie, for setting this up. Um, and please connect to us on LinkedIn. And if you have any questions, let us know. Definitely. And thank you guys so much for being such awesome panelists um, and Heidi for running running point. And sorry for all of like the little mini tech hiccups that happened throughout. But you know what, guys, what would a virtual conference be like without some of those to keep us on our toes? So thank you, attendees, for dialing in and partaking. And thank you guys again. I'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.